everyone, and welcome back to Here Be Dragons. It's me, Stephen, and this week, I don't have Nessie. I don't have John. Uh, Nessie's working. John isn't, he's played a little bit of D&D, &D, but <clears throat> like, I wanted to get people who have some, some miles, <laughs> miles on them playing this game. <clears throat> so I, I asked Emily and John, John should show up shortly, other John from, uh, from Gold Team. But uh, <clears throat> they're both very capable players and very capable dungeon masters and been around the block enough to, to see good players and good dungeon masters and also bad players and bad dungeon masters. And uh, uh, today we're just going to have a conversation about how, how to tell the difference, what to do, what not to do, because <clears throat> sort of the conceit of, the, of this video is how to be a good player and how to be a good dungeon master. But part of that is how not to be a bad one. So we'll uh, we'll be having that conversation. John, did I say John will be joining us as soon as he can? He's doing, he's got dad duty. So, you know, hey, many of us are parents and we, we get it. So he's going to take care of the kids and then he's going to jump on. Um, all right. Uh, I love that. Dice rolls in despair. <laughs> Uh, I okay. So, if you're here, you have some understanding of what the game is. I don't want to talk down and explain the the absolute basics. Um, there are other great videos out there. If you want to know what Dungeons and Dragons is, there are just type it into YouTube and you will figure that out. Um, I want to talk about how to how to be the best at it that you can possibly be. So. Emily, people know you, but like, but like, why don't you just tell them who you are, what you do, wh what's your pedigree for this sure. Uh, conversation? <laughs> sure. Um, yeah, uh, Emily, I go by Emily of the Eerie on Twitter. Um, I know you more through A Song of Ice and Fire fandom, but very quickly found out how much we both love D and D and got talking about that probably way more than we, we talk about game of Thrones or song of ice and fire at all. Um, I've been playing D and D for almost 10 years now. Um, started in my early twenties. Um, after actually a lot of failed starts, creating characters that never went anywhere in college, uh, finally got our, got our act together, um, and got a game going. I started with, uh, 3.5 edition. Um, okay. And, after uh, really while that campaign was still going on is when I cut over to fifth edition where, which I now uh, both DM and play in pretty regularly. So um, I've made a lot of characters I've run. I'm on my third campaign right now, actually. And then I run a lot of side games and other, uh, I don't know if you call them campaigns, but extended one shots. <laughs> so yeah, that's, uh, that's what I have to bring to the table. Wait a minute, what? Can you hold up Emily like you would show a cat so we can make sure her confirmation is correct? I have no idea. Jess, are you feeling okay? I have no idea what that means. But Jess is a lovely person, so it's oh, oh it's meant in a kind way, I'm sure. She anyway. That just threw me for a loop. Sorry. Um, <laughs> let's right. talk about D&D. I've been playing since I was nine. I am 46. I will let you all do the math. There have been ex extended periods of time where I did not play. Um, but for the most part, yes, I have played my whole life, really. Um, I've done more DMing than playing, but I've done a lot of playing, too. Um, and in my experience the biggest mistake people make when they are playing the game is trying to make the game about them if there's maybe a cardinal sin that's it as well and that goes for the dungeon master as well um Mm -hmm. The game is not about you. The game is about us. It is about everyone. Um, I played in a recent one shot and, and there was a very new person 
someone who had never played before in that campaign. And I made it my duty to be that person's best friend. And I was talkative and I was engaging with them. Oh, look, didn't take long at all. There's John. You get the bottom spot, though, because you're late. <laughs> oh, no. Thank you so much. Sorry about my tardiness. <laughs> we forgive you. Um, you shaved your beard. It's all gone. You never really have a beard, do you? No. I don't. <laughs> um, my co-host is also John, and the comings and goings of his beard are, are uh, fodder for conversation around here. Legendary. <laughs> right. Oh, uh, yeah. Thud was a consummate gentleman. That's the character I was just describing. Um, Kate played with me in that game. We played with another guy. Oddly enough, named John, who is not John Webster, my co-host, or you, John. It's another John. <laughs> but, um, yeah, we had a good time, but uh, the game is not about me. There are times when I'm playing a character and i like, I want to push the team in this direction, but my character wouldn't necessarily do that, so I'm not going to do that. The game is not about me. Uh, the game, the spotlight needs to fall on everyone sometimes and mm -hmm. again just trying to make the game about yourself is probably going to be the number one thing that's going to turn off everyone else at the table so i would say that's the cardinal sin because the cardinal rule is if you're having fun you're doing it right if you're hogging the spotlight you're the only one having fun yeah i would agree with that even in situations where we've been really focused on, you know, one particular character in, in the campaign that I DM, um, you know, I see my players trying to have conversations with each other, you know, just because something's happening, uh, you know, to our fighter doesn't mean that, you know, the, the sorcerer or the ranger don't have opinions on it either, you know, and, and um, that's their friend, that's their buddy. How do they feel about what's getting drawn into the action? You know, all that matters. I I totally agree with you. I think sometimes people um, also want to just play with the DM. Like they want, they want to describe what their character do, does and then find out what the world does back. And it's like everyone at the table around you is a character too. And, and sometimes what's going on between you and another player is way more important than anything that the DM has planned or is pushing or, or whatever. Um, you know, I would encourage people to, to remember to, you know, look around the table a lot more, not just at who's behind the DM screen. Right. Like can... Go ahead, John. Yeah. I, I feel like when, um, the time comes to come up with a plot or a plan, um, sometimes the pressure can end up landing on, uh, your rogues, your uh, chaotic characters, and sometimes just the player who is best at that sort of thing. Um, and so uh, what I love to do is sort of take a, a page from Ocean's Eleven when coming up with a plot um, and make sure that everybody has a role. Everybody has a thing that they do that makes this plot work. And some of my favorite times are when the plot fails and somebody has to deviate from the script. Um, this just came up uh, one time at, at one of my tables uh, I almost died as our trickery cleric uh, because I, I got too clever with my for my own good, and um, it made for some really good role playing. After I admitted, like my plan wasn't very good. Thanks for saving me, everybody. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, yeah, having the the time to let everyone shine uh, is so vital. Yeah, you remind me of a, a recent uh, moment in the campaign that Steven just joined that, that Julie, who I think is in the chat is DMing where my character was a champion and she had to go out and, uh, you know, fight against someone to kind of defend the city that she was in. And, uh, she goes out there. I like crit fail on my, my initiative and I crit fail on my first attack and just get the floor wiped with me. It was like the most embarrassing thing. And, you know, that moment was about me, but then when we move on to other stuff, like my character's kind of reserved and in the back and like, very wounded pride and then is you know coping with everyone that she knows and respects watching that happen very publicly you know absolutely potter that was great um but, uh, but yeah emily you're, you're absolutely right how how important it is uh to have your characters get chastised a little bit sometimes because it's not always going to work out yeah i mean i think if you have good trust between you and your dm or or if you are the dm you and your players that um I don't know, like my players know that I'm not 
out to torture them. You know, I'm out to, you know, tell a story with them, not to them. And, and so that means that sometimes if they do get, you know, knocked down, um, I'm not out there trying to ruin the game for them or trying to make them have a bad time. Like that's a learning experience. They can grow from that as a character. And, and I think the, the more seasoned players are the players who are, are used to it or have, have seen the completion of, of something like that um, are more willing to trust. But, uh, you know, I think at least trying to extend that kind of trust at your table is important. I think my favorite formulation of that principle is as a DM, you need to root for your players um, because you're not, necessarily creating an adversarial table unless that's something that your players have asked for um and you're not in charge of just sort of protecting them from everything you need to give them solid challenges but then hope that they'll succeed um and uh, i feel like that sort of attitude leads toward the best uh nail biter kind of um campaigns and stories absolutely yeah um but I, I guess that still all falls under the umbrella of sharing the spotlight mm -hmm. because the DM needs their time to shine as well. I've got this plot point or I've prepared this uh, action set piece or this puzzle and, and the players should engage with that because the DM puts time and effort into that. And I hear what you're saying about your sort of like Ocean's Eleven approach. Uh, I tend to approach it more like a TV show Hmm. where th maybe for this three or four episode arc, one character is kind of focused on more than the rest, especially if it's an ongoing campaign. And then somebody else gets their short arc, uh, ideally one that still f slots into the main story somehow. Mm -hmm. um, but every nobody is the main character it is an ensemble piece television show and if i'm the dungeon master which i usually am um that means that i am the director and the set designer i, I am not the villain uh, i mean sometimes you are but that's not all you are and i think right. that that's what people forget you know is is um, you know, I've definitely had a player who was very much like the DM is out to get me. It's me versus the DM. And like as a DM, that is a really hard player to DM for because even when you're giving them a great moment, there's like this distrust of like, is this actually a mimic? Is this actually going to destroy? Mm -hmm. You know, it's like calm down. Like sometimes a door is just a door. Walk through it. Like, uh, <laughs> you know, um, that can be a little exhausting at the table long term. Some of that harkens back to the old school game which was a d more way more dungeon crawly way mm -hmm. more traps way more hidden dangers so you are forced you to be careful you'll find it's a lot of the old heads that still have that mindset where they they don't want to trust the dungeon master <laughs> well you know there there are some really great ways to blend those approaches as well to to uh make it you know part of a dungeon crawl um or to allow a, a player who maybe wasn't set up to be the main character of the moment to take the spotlight in in the moment because of the way that things go in the because of the way the dice lead you I guess um, a, a good example is a, a campaign that I've been a part of for a while now recently made um, the opening of a door we're trying to go meet some Durgar uh, and to open their door you had to press your hand against this plinth and then confess a sin or else you couldn't take your hand away from the plinth. So pressing the button opened the door, but if you didn't confess something that you were ashamed of, then you couldn't leave the plinth. And all five of us had to, to push the button. Everyone had to do a little role playing and, and come up with something our characters were um, uh, you know, ashamed of. And one, one player was like, I can't think of anything for my character. And, and he's like, I'm stuck to the plinth. Um, I feel like I'm a righteous paladin, you know, I'm, I'm fighting the good fight. And we're like, there are all sorts of things you're doing right now. <laughs> you know, you any of those to be uh, sinful. And so eventually um, they had to come up with, with something that was sort of based on their pride and the way that they uh, couldn't let go. And I, I thought that was such a wonderful, it was part of a dungeon crawl for sure, but it also forced us to do some uncomfortable role playing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I actually love that idea. Uh, I might, those of you who play in my games, you might face something like that in the not too distant future because I kind of love that idea. 
Yeah. Uh, right. it, it's forcing characters to role play something. Um, Matthew has got an interesting comment. He's been DMing for a few months now, and his biggest struggle is getting his more reserved players to be more involved. That is something you cannot force, but part of the way you can do that is have NPCs become interested in that character for whatever reason. Are they a warrior? I'm interested in your fighting ability. Can you teach me to fight? Um, I'm. Are you good looking? Well, maybe I'm romantically interested in you. Not all characters are comfortable with that. Not all players are comfortable with that. Yeah. And you should make sure you know before you do that. Um, I guess, and that's a whole other thing we can talk about in a minute, is the expectations of everyone at the table. Because I, I have misfired and, and said and done things in my game that have upset people. And it's not a fun feeling. Um, fortunately, I'm a, the people I play with are caring and loving enough that we resolved it and we're all still playing together. It's all good. Um, but I have overstepped my bounds before. Um, but if you want to get players who are not deeply involved, more involved, find out, and maybe this is just a friend to friend type question, not even a dungeon master to player question, but just be like, what is it that you want out of this game? Are you just playing this because you're trying to make me happy? What would be a cool, because, you know, the purpose is to have fun. What do you think is the fun part of this game? I can, you can then try to serve that to them. Yeah. Uh, so and as with any good relationship, communication is key. I kind of want to, oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, let yourself be surprised by their answer. I've gotten people who said, all I want to do is hang out with you guys. I, I like being in this room. And, you know, if that means that I can swing a sword once in a while and help decapitate a basilisk, that's cool. That's all I want to do. I don't necessarily have to be the center of attention. That's a great point. I kind of wanted to tie this back to what we were talking about earlier about, you know, uh, you know, don't hog the table as, as a, if you're if you're a player at the table and there you do have another reserved person or a new person in your party, you know, them being quiet isn't your opportunity to fill the air with more stuff that your character is doing. I've seen that happen before where, you know, uh, everyone's making checks around the room and someone wants to do seven skill checks before anyone else has had a chance to do one thing or the reserve player just isn't offering up time or, or getting a lot of air. So, you know, I think what I've seen really good players do is, is notice the shy player and, you know, take a little bit of that load off of your DM and, and decide I'm going to befriend them like Steven was talking about, or, or maybe you're not even going to befriend them because that's not in character for you, but you can, you, you can still role play with someone without befriending them. Um, uh, you, you know, uh, I <laughs> I play with a married couple, and and the wife is newer to D and D, and and her character is is reserved and doesn't like to talk a ton, and her husband uh, is playing a tabaxi rogue, and and she's not a fan of the character, but like they still interact a ton and it's hilarious and it draws her into the game more. To you know, oh well, I've got to make a sassy comeback to this. I'm not going to let his you know, BS shenanigans stand and it brings her into the game a little bit more. So, you know, you, you can be that, you, you can be the solution to that as a DM or as a player. Uh, okay. Matthew, I'm glad you, uh, you got something out of that that's useful to you, but I would also say like, as both Emily and John just pointed out, sometimes they're already getting what they want and, and, and that's okay. You can't force them to be more sociable in the game. But that also, that gives you free reign to focus a little bit more on the other characters who do want that aspect. And if they change their mind, you know, a good dungeon master is going to take that into account. And, and this you could, is... You could, you could also try the NPC approach and see if that gets them more involved. This is also a really good... Um... A really, I think it ties in very much to the question of character death as well. Uh, some players love having their characters die and it makes them feel great to roll on a new character. Others hate it so much and, and want to be the person who survives to the end. So, um, you know, it, uh, I think that, that expectation is also tied up in what you get out of your table um, is if you're you're living through your character or if you're 
happy to inhabit a character for a little bit of time and then move on. Um, and I think that uh, trusting the the player and the the DM relationship um, is so important for that as well. Yeah, I, I agree. Like, so we're we've got this idea that it, it's not about me. Sometimes it's about me. Everybody has a turn in the turn order. Uh, everybody gets their their time to shine. Nobody's the main character, and honestly it's got this gestalt aspect where a party isn't four individuals. It's one thing that's more powerful than the four individuals when they learn how to really function together as a group. Um, that's a lot of fun. It doesn't always happen early on. It doesn't always happen in every game. Yeah. But it, uh, it uh, does need to you you need to try to do it mm -hmm. sorry i just i was just reading that private message mm -hmm. um i think that is absolutely doable emily yeah we're gonna yeah. We, we will be talking about new players and and new and new characters and whatnot but um so uh, that's sort of like where i wanted to start the conversation there are other more practical things you can do to bring your A game to the table. Um, I'm gonna say table just because that's traditionally how we play. I haven't played around a table in a couple of years now, but uh, it's always gonna be my table, you know? Mm -hmm. Do you but, think that's something we should put on the agenda for tonight too, is there are some differences for sure about running a room with people who are all there in the room with you eating out of the same bowl of M&Ms versus uh, spread out all over the country. You know? Or all over the world. Yeah. Or all over the world. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I mean, talk about whatever you want. Yeah, really, I mean. As long as it's a, like how to be a good player or a good DM. Yeah. yeah. So so I think, you know, just the, the top of my mind is if you're playing over the internet, please make the extra little effort to stay engaged because it can be so easy to be distracted on the internet. Whereas at the table, you can kind of be like, and, uh, and and get the person back. Um, yeah. You know, if you start hearing like video game music over the, the internet, um, that's a real bummer and can really um, just ruin a whole session, honestly. Oh yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's it's so easy. Like, I, I, like in my office, I work from home, so I'm lucky to have like my multiple monitors and it can be easy to just be tempted to pull up an article or start going off on a, even if it's somewhat related to the game, going off on a tangent, researching some spell or something, you know, mm -hmm. it's easy to get drawn out of it. I think a lot, a lot easier than when you're in person. And, and I think it does take a little bit more focus and energy. And I think, you know, DMs can help that by scheduling a break into the session. Um, you know, I think if you know, okay, like I can check my phone in a half hour, I'm going to have a little break. Like it, it makes it a little easier to, to stay engaged too. Um, Oh, yeah. I'm raising my I, hand I to that. <laughs> yeah. Yes. I think that's most of us now. Uh, <laughs> but like tangentially related to what you're saying, if you are sitting at a table, don't be doing this. Definitely. With, with, uh, beyond, a, a tool that's available to everybody. Uh, it's really easy to do your roles in app. Um, but don't then get distracted and drift away just because you had to, you know, make that last skill check. Now I'm tweeting and yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, I think, I think that can be tough. You know, I think, you know, when, when you're not actively doing something at the table, that, that doesn't mean I mentally check out when you are in a situation in person in a tense situation, trying to solve a problem or, I mean, I don't think a lot of us get into combat in real life, but you know, I mean, when you're, when you're in role play situations, when you're in situations, you don't just mentally check out when you're not actively saying something you are there, you are present, you are in character. And I think, you know, for, for people who like actually like trying to be in character while, while they play, which certainly enriches the game, it is a lot easier to just, you know, be Marsley, the halfling monk for four hours than to be Marsley for five minutes and then be Emily on Twitter for five minutes. And, you know, bounce back and forth, you know, that, that doesn't add a lot to the game for other people. And just, uh, I wanted to throw up Sean. <laughs> oh, you said, ref oh, you said refer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Oh, Dan. Oh, you Dan plays games with people in other countries too, I guess. Yeah. And Lady Lee Thunderpill and Jaded Redhead and Jess Britbeck. All hail the Knights Queen, <laughs> I think. Uh, and Sasa K as well, who asked the question to begin with. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so like the Dungeon Master has to be there all the time. The, if you're a player, your responsibility at the table is different than the Dungeon Master's, but no less important and, does, and requires no less of your attention. Because a good player is trying to figure out how to maximize the potential of their entire team. Mm -hmm. It is a it is a team sport, y'all. Mm -hmm. um, there, that's why there are different roles to be played. Role playing um, originally was defined as what is your role: fighter, magic user, cleric, or thief. And having one of each of them was considered the ideal party because you could help overcome the widest variety of, of uh, circumstances. Now, the modern incarnation of D&D, roles can be way more ambiguously defined. You can be a striker or a support class or a ranged damage dealer or the stealth type. There are lots. The roles have changed, but the idea of playing a role as part of a team has not changed. Um, and understanding not only your role but how to make your role work with the other roles which requires your full time attention and engagement it's not oh it's my turn i swing my sword at it i rolled a 17 that hits here's my damage and i the next time you hear my voice is when i'm rolling dice again to hit on my next turn mm -hmm. you yeah. can be shouting encouragement you can be exchanging ideas like too much crosstalk during a fight is not great but there are things you can do to well, stay that's, engaged that's what the chat function brings to the table too like you i mean i think one thing that can be hard about an online game is it's a little harder to tell what's going on when people are talking over each other into your headphones than it is at a table um but that, like use the chat. I mean, I, my players do it and I love it. You know, I have some players who've even like written complex macros and stuff like that in, in roll 20 to make use of it. And uh, it's cool for me as a DM to kind of see what they're doing or get an idea because I might react to that when it is their turn or I might, you know, be able to pull that in. Um, and, and, you know, that then you're staying engaged. Then you are still there in the moment when, when it's not your turn. Um, and at the level of the mechanics too, um, especially in modern editions, um, characters are designed at a mechanical level to contribute more than the sum of their abilities to the whole of the party. And um, if you think about tactics and you know what your spells do on your on your sheet, you know what your abilities are, uh, you'll be that much more effective. Um, mm -hmm. I think everyone's had the experience of reading through their character sheet and being like, oh, I get advantage on dungeon checks. I forgot about that entirely. Um, but keeping that to a minimum is is a huge part of making your character as effective as they can be mechanically while mm -hmm. also filling whatever role your character is in the party uh role playing wise and um sort of more more broadly defined you're touching on something like really important i think for me here as a dm it's like um i have to know and keep track and we all do i think we all dm you know of so much so many things i have to keep track of and um, it's helpful for me if you know the basics of how to play your character. I mean, ideally, you know how to play them very, very well. But um, I know for new players, there's a lot to figure out. And, uh, you know, I think if you don't know, if you don't understand something about your character, you, you know, there are moments to ask about that, too. You know, um, during someone else's turn, not the moment to ask me a mechanical question about your player. That's extremely rude happens a lot um you know i th i think um i i think i don't know it, it just helps you know I, if i know on my turn how to play my character my turn m might be 30 seconds to two minutes depending on how complicated the turn is if i am still figuring it out if i don't really understand how my my thing works then i'm going through my whole sheet every time it's my turn and trying to make choices and and um 
that also, you know, breaks immersion for the table as well. And, and I'm not saying you can't be stumped and need a second in combat and that long turns don't happen. And that sometimes my turns are long too, but as the DM, but um, you know, the best you can do to kind of have a rough idea of, of how to play and what to do when the moment comes and it is on you, the the better it is for the whole table. Cause well, I think, think there's one, Oh, I was going to say, just to, I mean, imagine if it's not your turn and someone is taking a lot, you know, everyone's been in that situation and be frustrated. It's so like, try not to be that person very often. Yeah. I, well, and there's one thing I think that a DM can do as well to help facilitate that sort of interaction and, uh, and that sort of like ease of turn taking. And that is to um, sort of be clear as to when they're going to be using rules as written in combat and when they're going to allow for, um, deviations from that. So, you know, obviously spellcasters sort of, you, you have to make that determination early. If you let somebody with Ray of Frost freeze locks and, uh, you know, break their way into prisons and stuff, you're expanding the role of a wizard to um, absorb that of a rogue or, or whatever. So you have to be a little bit careful about when you rules as written uh, your spells and when you don't. But it, it can include other things too. Um, you know, tossing that uh, thousand ball bearings down the stairs does it just turn it into uh, difficult terrain or do you allow for uh, the whole Disney movie, all the guards run into each other and slip down the stairs and they're all gone and the encounter's over sort of thing? No. Well, as a good dungeon master, I think you need to be ready for both eventualities. Definitely. Mm -hmm. And and again, there's a lot of different sort of ways you could describe D&D &D, uh, to try to nutshell it. Playing pretend with math uh, is is one way I, but, but being playing pretend is like you've got to make it up as you go. It is uh, improv. It's actually, being good at improv is a huge skill to being not only a good dungeon master but also a good player. Right. Uh, there's a lot. There's a reason a lot of theater nerds love this game. Mm -hmm. Yep. The internets are really fun to play D and D with. <laughs> yeah. Well, I was not a theater nerd. Technically, uh, I was a choir nerd. Although I did do some outside, like community theater stuff. Yeah, you're a theater nerd. It's fine. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I think one thing that really can help, you know, because I, I think, I don't want to, I don't want to make what I said before sound like memorize everything if you don't you're a bad D, &D player you're not especially if you're new there's, there's um, a learning curve for sure but as a dm you can really help facilitate that i mean for me like having a session zero was helpful but having like a session 0 0.2 for the newer players that could be one-on-one -on -one where you really go through everything i found that to be really helpful um you know, maybe every six months to a year, I will offer, you know, hey, who wants to have a one on one with me, the DM to check in and, um, you know, my cleric, who's a shy player checked in with me and, and we like spent two hours and she got to ask me all the questions about the things on the sheet that she didn't fully understand that she, you know, maybe hadn't been utilizing to the full effect because she didn't want to interrupt the game or, or you know, it didn't really come to her or she just ignored that part of her sheet. Um, and that made a huge difference after after we did that. And I, I think not just for for me um, feeling like she was getting more out of the game, but also I think for her own enjoyment of it as well. And and I also use that as a moment to say, do you want more plot stuff for your character or not? And you know, we had had a bit of stuff focused on her before, and she was like, no, like that was plenty. I don't want the spotlight on me more right now, but this is what I'm loving and can we keep doing stuff like that? It was just great. And I, I, I really recommend that. And if you are a player and you're not sure if your DM would be up for it, ask them. I guarantee they would be. Um... Right on. I yeah. think this all falls under the umbrella of know your character. Mm -hmm. And and that's from a mechanical as well as a uh, role-playing aspect. Now, role-playing has multiple meanings the original meaning being that like what where do you fit in when 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 things go sideways um and but it's it's really kind of the meaning has changed to mean pretending to be a character pretending you know playing a part in this action adventure tv show about a group of awesome individuals who band together to do awesome or terrible things 
um, and not and knowing not only how do the mechanics of my character work, but what is the personality? You, so many characters are so great under pressure in a way that most of us really aren't. Um, and fair talk, they're the heroes of the story. You, yeah. There's a reason you and I aren't action adventure heroes. <laughs> um, Speak for yourself, but okay. No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Still There's waiting. On that. I'm not okay. Yeah. Uh, Chainmail's in the mail. Okay. <laughs> um, um, you know that that's you're making a really great point though, and about the personality of characters because um, you know one of the things that I love is when people are willing to be a little bit less than ideal in order to bring out the the heart and soul of their character, and I wonder sometimes how everybody reacts to say playing against uh, a cowardly character, somebody who runs from the first round of combat because some players hate that and they want people to, yeah. No, 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 no. Oh. That, like I, my favorite character I've ever played ran from combat every chance he got until he forged closer relationships with the rest of the party and was sort of in a position where he's like, I have to do something or my best friend is going to die. Mm -hmm. And that was a huge thing but yeah playing the coward is a can be incredibly rewarding y'all incredibly rewarding even yeah. if you're not the coward i mean just do you want your character to already be this fully formed idyllic perfect version of themselves at level one or three or whatever level you start at or do you want to give them challenges that they can overcome with time you know and uh become the fully formed hero that they want to be i mean to me one one of those options sounds a lot more appealing. You know, you're you're not just leveling up your fighting skills; like you're leveling up your understanding of the world and your place in it, and uh, you know, maybe making some changes. Uh, that that, that's a, some really excellent advice for dungeon masters: is is give make insist that your characters have room to grow into. Like, you want to write an awesome backstory? Go ahead, but. If you write a 17 page backstory filled with intrigue and, 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 and awesome, interesting things that happen to you, trust me, that's going to be the best part of that character's story. Yeah. Because, exactly. be, because it will be basically all the coolest stuff already happened to you. Mm -hmm. When you so, had four hit points somehow. <laughs> right. <laughs> foundational terms right remember we call it experience for a reason it, yeah. it's the your character's experiences and how they deal with problems and how they approach traps and monsters that's what is making them better people it's not just they get infused by an extra bump of magic so right yeah absolutely no i don't think he is kelly Two so, other members of Gold Team are coming, but John could not make it. He's got young kids, so. Yeah, that's why I was a little late today. Family obligations, unfortunately, uh, are making it impossible for me. I was, although I would love to, and I wish everybody who's going to be there the best time, because I think you're going to have it. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, we'll we'll hoist one in your honor. Right. Um, okay. I, I lost the train of thought. We were talking about talking about you know giving your character room to go grow you know oh, one yeah. thing i was gonna one thing i was gonna say too is i know a lot of dms like in character creation like even in that session zero will sometimes hand wave that like oh you could ignore like the bonds and character traits and and flaws part of your thing That's because good, you know in the book it's like kind of clunky and it's like do you want to roll on a table and find out what your flaw is and like no but even if you don't like boiling it down into a couple of bullet points like that, these are things that you need to think of. And if you're building a character who doesn't have a flaw, like why, you know, that's all very unrealistic. You are not a God. Um, yeah, I, and if you're, if you're building a character without a bond, without a reason to be part of the story, like that's going to be a problem for the whole table and, and you should mm -hmm. really try. And if you don't know how talk to the other players, see why they're there. Maybe you're, their childhood best friend and you're dragged into everything that they do, you know, maybe uh, th there's a lot of ways you can go with it. Maybe the DM can give you an idea for why you would care because they know more about the world than you do at that point, but so, it, you need it. On, on that point. So personally, I didn't come to D and D through the, the, uh, you know, path of a theater kid. I came through 
uh, the path of an English nerd. And so I had to walk the hard road of overbuilding my world building before my players came in and played. Uh, and I learned a lot about letting people affect my world. And I've come to be the sort of DM, and, and this doesn't work for everybody, this is just my own personal thing, who um, is happy to build out most of the stuff, where the cities are, uh, you know, what, what they produce, what monsters are in the area, that sort of thing. But then if my players say something like, hey, can I be like the son of a local knight? And I hadn't thought about any local knights. I got to still say yes to that sort of thing and build in um, my player's ability to affect my world. And so if somebody comes in with a bond that I'm not expecting, I'm the son of the, the local grain merchant or something. And um, I have to build in that grain merchant now. And, and I should, I think, uh, in, in my games anyway. And so I'm, I'm really hoping that you know, when you go to the DM and, and you say, hey, DM, I don't know exactly what sort of bond to have. Can you tell me a little more about your world? That the DM says, yeah, I can. But what kind of thing would you like to do? Uh, you know, and, and what kind of uh, place would you like to hold in the world? Because that place probably exists in a well-formed world, even if it's not something I've already thought of and written down in my books. Yeah, it is a collaborative experience. Yeah. Uh, Potter pointing out some of the he is our, our sort of like resident enthusiast for the old school way. I mean, he plays 5e with us plenty as well, um, but he, he has a genuine love for the old school game also. And he's right. Uh, early on, like old school D&D, a first level character is not the same as a first level character in uh, fifth edition. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because yeah, I feel like by virtue of having a hero class you're already more powerful than 99 percent of the people in the world yeah yep i would agree it's not a it's not technically a dungeons and dragons product but it is a um an adaptation of fourth edition rules called shadow of the demon lord starts everyone out as a level zero character essentially a commoner and what happens to you over the course of your first adventure helps to dictate what class you end up taking uh when you take your first hero level so it's kind of a neat um, you know, mechanicalized way of, of building. Yeah, I'm not building. sure I love that, but, yeah. uh, you know, but like there are people that would love that and, and let them play that game by all means. Because right. again, rule number one, if you're having fun, you're doing it right. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I just feel like the best way to ensure you're going to have the most fun and the people around you are going to have the most fun, as we said, know your character. Know your role. Realize that sometimes your role is to get the hell out of the way and let somebody else have their moment. Sometimes it's to be the best friend. Sometimes it's the one to be in the spotlight all by themselves. Sometimes it's the person to stand there with mouth agape, staring in wonder. Uh, because all of those different aspects are part of the game. Yeah, and I think if you are comfortable jumping between those things and reacting to the world around you instead of, I'm this unflappable hero, and no matter what, I laugh in the face of danger or whatever it is, you know, I think, I, I, you know, that that's hard for a DM. You know, I've, I, I remember I was recently DMing this big boss fight that we've been building to for like six months with this vampire, and she was using some of her abilities, and there were like rats like coming down the wall by the like hundreds and the players were like, I attack, I'm fine. I'd continue. And I'm like, like, is no one freaking out about this genuine horror movie scene going on? Am I not describing it good enough? You know, um, I think, you know, uh, the, the, the DM's putting the world there for you to react to, not just to mm -hmm. continue, you know, kicking ass to the optimal ability of your character sheet, you know? Um, but, and that's another thing, like, okay, I'm going to talk about a bad habit that some players have. Your character does not need to make the absolute optimized, efficient move every turn. Mm -hmm. If you are spending 15 minutes trying to crunch numbers and have this idea and I want to compare it to that idea and you're getting analysis paralysis, you need to eeny, meeny, miny that one. Flip a coin and go with it because not everything everybody does, especially in the heat of the moment, is optimized and absolutely efficient you need to 
uh, and whatever role it is, however you are engaging in that, it's it is important for you to know what you need to do ahead of time, mm -hmm. which goes back to knowing your character. Don't take 15 minutes to decide what spell you're going to cast. Know what your spells do. We're in combat. You have six the seconds. You right. know. The most you should be deciding is, do I want to heal a person? Do I want to blast? Do I need to protect myself? And make a choice and go with it, even if it's not optimal. Well, and, and to spellcasters out there who are like, but spell slots, those are really important. I don't want to blow a spell slot on the wrong thing. That's why cantrips are there. So if you, exactly if you like aren't it. sure, like, and you really don't know, and you're, you're trying to figure out mechanically what would make the most sense, like, that's the moment where I think an experienced player will just be like, I'm blasting off Ray of Frost and moving on because I'll figure it out by next turn. And, and, um, and the thing is, that helps. <laughs> <laughs> yeah um, someone who knows their role yes the bard, yeah. <laughs> we found the we found the bard no i'm kidding <laughs> yeah. yeah um yeah rat, rats get some love around here i used to have pet rats jolie has pet rats so we rats get a little love from hbd crew or play a simpler class you are not wrong, Craig, uh, yeah. which is why when I recently played with a brand new player who was very trepidatious about what he was going to be playing, I was just like, play a fighter. You don't have to know spells. I in general, your idea should be shoot them with your bow because that's how you've set it up for combat. Now, engage in the non-combat stuff, however you think the quarterback of the football team would because that's sort of the personality type he was going for you know like a, a, a leader uh, somebody who can rally people and, and come up with a plan but if you're fighting shoot him with your bow you know and, and, and one of the cool things about fighters is that they develop over time at least in 5e um they they develop new abilities they develop almost a suite of spells uh they're not exactly spells but they're they're close and um as you get more comfortable with making tactical calls on the field, uh, your fighter can do some some interesting stuff um, on the fly. Yeah, absolutely. I think my the fighters in my party, yeah, we have two of them, one's an arcane archer. They probably have some of the most interesting and unique turns now that we're at higher levels because, you know, they do get all that, that cool stuff. I mean, um, but but yeah, I think, and, and if you're sitting there like, Oh my god! But like, I picked a wizard, and I'm level two, and I I'm new, and I barely know what's going. Like, it's okay. Like, don't burn right. your character sheet. Like, it's it's okay. Right. Like, um. this, honestly, <laughs> this conversation that we're having right now is really aimed at at players who have made it through the beginner stage of the game. Like, you've played a few. I don't need to be teaching you the rules. Uh, what I'm trying to tell you is is how to be better now that you're you're playing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think there's this conception that, like, you know, the DM has to, like, log on and do a bunch of extra work. And, you know, they are, if you're not using pre-made content, especially have to do a lot of work to, you know, write the story, develop the encounters, etc. Um, and that, like, you know, players can just kick back, show up for the game and do their thing. And, um, you know, I mean, it's it's show your DM that you appreciate them by, by you know, um, taking the time to figure that stuff out. And it doesn't have to be in a vacuum. It doesn't have to be instantly uh you know if you really you know you don't have to become the perfect player or anything but but help them out as much as as you can to the best of your ability right well do a little bit of, that, i'm sorry john go ahead well i was just gonna say i think that sometimes people think that um being the perfect player means like guessing the solution to the puzzle right away and that's interact with the world is really all that i think you can ask a player to do with the dm's world right interact wrong sometimes interact uh curiously interact with enthusiasm and uh recklessly sometimes and that makes the game that much better than the person who says i've deduced that the door must be opened by the crank over here because uh you know whatever reasons uh, because i rolled a great investigation check i don't know um in interacting wrongly with uh, a puzzle or even a combat interaction can be so exciting um down the line so don't be afraid 
Yeah, I mean, dice rules don't have to be the only thing that introduced chaos into the <laughs> equation, you know? Right. Yeah. Um, can I talk about something? All right, there is a couple of metagame things that I want to bring up as well. Like, there is this thing, don't split the party. Everyone's heard it. And it's it's true not just for surviving, but also for keeping when everyone is together, everyone is engaged at the same thing at the same time. Now, obviously, there are going to be times where the party does split up. And there are times when, you know, we're in town. I'm I'm going over to the magic shop and I'm going to the blacksmith and I'm going to the potion shop and everybody. And that's fine. I'm probably not going to introduce a combat scenario there. Although, if you pick a fight, you're going to pick a fight. You know, uh, it is what it is. But don't split the party because you can't engage everyone in the same story if they're not together. That's a tension management advice as much as it is game mechanics advice. If you don't split the party, everyone can interact with each other. If you mm -hmm. split the party, then all of a sudden you have to create manage two tables at once and everyone's still sitting at the same table. Yeah, I mean, I think that like, you know, DMs with a lot of experience can handle it. I think that there are, you know, certainly occasional circumstances where where it fits, you know, and sometimes the DM will introduce situations where, oh, well, this one character has an audience with someone. And so we're going to spend a few minutes on that. But um, overall, yeah, don't be don't be trying to, you know. <laughs> I think we kind of did this in our last game together, Stephen, just by running in two separate directions in a complex cave system and yeah. spending half the session just spend it. I spend my turn running 60 feet towards the action. No, I, I my a, turn is over. <laughs> yeah, that, I did that for two or three turns, literally just ran the other way to try to head them off at the pass. Um, as spending key points as a monk to go faster and just like. My, my best uh, my best experiences with splitting the party have come in higher narrative games and lower simulation games. Mm -hmm. And I think that the reason why that is is because you can kind of fade to black and say, okay, you here's your scene. It's two minutes. Uh, you know, now rather than narrating your walk uh, from the audience chamber down the stairs through the rest of the guild hall, whatever, um, you can just say, okay, you you rejoin the party an hour later. And that's it. We've we've teleported you there, and uh, we've skipped over all the boring stuff in between. Whereas if you're a little bit more simulationist, splitting the party can lead to um, some really crunchy stuff that you just can't be a part of as one of the players. Well, and maybe part of being a good dungeon master is knowing where that where the line exists, because you do not have to be one or the other. You do not have to be hyper into detail or just hand wavy about everything. Um, I, I tend to want to break out tactical maps for the big boss fight type encounters, the ones where there's more of an environmental issue. If I'm just fighting, you know, if they're fighting mobs or uh, a whole bunch of them against one big monster, a lot of times we just theater of the mind that there's no need for that. There's no need for like hardcore sticking to the tactical map and all the flanking. Yeah, yeah, you're flanking. No problem. Yeah, I think it I think it depends on who's at your table. Like one thing that I have learned when as a player is that I really am a visual person and that sometimes the the you know just verbal descriptions like even if it's not a map, even if there's no grid, like just putting like I've literally just used different dice before down to get a relational idea really helps me as a player. And I had a DM who, for whatever reason, like would refuse to do this at his table because he didn't need it. And, you know, that to me, I, you know, I, I really wish we could have come to a better agreement with that because it, it takes two seconds. And I, I think you have to adapt your table to the needs of your players. You know, if you uh, if you know that uh, you have players who learn differently, you know, as a DM, there are ways you can assist them and be mindful of that at your table to make it a, a better game for everybody, I think. And I, I don't think that's what you were talking about, Stephen. And I know you know your players really well and, and whether or not they need that. But uh, just but the counterpoint. It's nice to have said out loud, yeah. you know, in the context of the conversation we're having. Know your players. Know your dungeon master. Um, and that's part of a bigger conversation. Like, we're when we're going to hit the midpoint here soon. And when we come back, I definitely want to talk about like a session zero stuff and also which can lead into this conversation about uh, 
new players and building the first character. Mm -hmm. um, but I kind of wanted to continue on the thought process we're already having relating to knowing your character. You need to understand the rules. When, when the, if you've played five sessions and I say, roll initiative, and you say, how do I do that? You have not lived up to your end of the bargain on some level. You need to be doing your homework. There are things you need to be doing at the table that make you conscious of the other players. But before, you know, if it's your first time ever and you're, you know, I'm going to hold your hand as a dungeon master and, and we'll all get through it together. As long as we're having fun, that's great. But at some point, it's the story that everybody wants to engage with that they're trying to derive their fun from and everything that detracts from that lessens the fun. We're all human. We're all going to not nail it every time, but you can, you need to do your homework so that you can nail it as often as possible. Knowing how your spells work, knowing what your spell save DC is, you know, um, not having, and if you don't, I mean, if, if you get through three sessions and you're like, they, you know, I see initiative on my sheet. They asked me to roll initiative. Don't fully get what I'm like, th you know, th then that's a good thing to ask. You know, uh, I mean, I think that some of us who have been playing for a long time could forget that, like, you know, some of these things just are meaningless to people who have just started. And, mm -hmm. and you know, it, it's kind of that collaborative um, agreement that you make when you come to a table together. It's like, you know, if you don't know it, uh, part of finding out what you don't know is asking the question. So if you get to session five and you haven't asked, I don't really get what you mean here, or or, or I've heard you ask, and when you explain it to me, I do it, but I, it's not clicking. You know, that's something that you can bring up, and that that allows your DM to help you. It allows that that roadblock to be knocked down if you if you talk about it. I mean, it all just comes down to communication. As I think both of you have alluded to, um, the learning doesn't all have to happen at once either. Um, knowing just what you're good at as a character. I'm a ranger and I picked bows, so I'm good at bows. In a pinch, if I don't know what else to do, I can shoot it with my bow. Is you know that that's a good thing to know, and it's um, the sort of the foundation of every character. Knowing maybe I shouldn't shoot it with the bow, maybe I should try this other class feature. It comes with with time and experience. Yeah, yep. for sure. Um, uh, but you, you, that's a solid point, John, knowing this is what I'm good at. You don't even have to know everything you're good at, but like, know your top abilities. Like I, I'm playing a rogue. What does that mean? That means when somebody needs to sneak past or pick a lock, that's your job. You deal with the underworld stuff. If you know, mm -hmm. Which, by the way, I'm going to do an all rogues game soon. And start the party at third level and require everyone to have at least one level of rogue so we can do a thieves guild game it's going to be a blast i can't wait um <laughs> but uh yeah know know your character and again we've talked a lot about the mechanics but i'm just going to say it one more time knowing the personality that they bring to the table and personalities are not cookie cutters Fi not every fighter is the same because fighters are everything from Mesoamerican jaguar warriors to samurais to medieval knights to Zulu warriors to the people that is a soldier. Mm -hmm. The warrior archetype is a fighter. And if you think that every person who ever swung a sword is the same as every other person who ever swung a sword, you, you're obviously missing out on a great deal of... <laughs> that everyone is different just because the fighter class doesn't sort of stamp it with an identity the way a lot of other classes do actually i think that's very liberating i think i think fighters have one of the greatest opportunities to be rp characters mm -hmm. because they don't have to fit a design role but you know every rogue is, is a sneaky double dealer or every bard is horny for every person on the planet that break the mold with that i'm playing a rogue in a game right now he is a rogue slash wizard and as a wizard he is a frontliner because rogue's got a great ability to sort of maneuver around the battlefield 
but he's also lawful good. Um, I'm here to help, but lead follower, get the hell out of the way. I don't have time to coddle you. I don't have time to, to worry about your feelings. I'm here to do a job. I'm here to help, but get out of the way and let me do that. Um, that is not the typical rogue archetype. Um, and it's fun because of that, I think. Mm-hmm. People who are playing 5e, um, they, they can't make a huge mistake in, in terms of character building. Uh, if you spend your proficiency point in one place, then all that means is you you didn't spend it in another. But it's not quite the same as wasting your individual skill points all over the, the map like you could do a little bit in 3.5. Oh, my um, gosh. Yeah. So, so, <laughs> so by, by, that, by that, I mean, like in a game with Steven recently, I played um, a druid who knew nothing about his own religion. Um, and people would ask him, like, you know, when, when, whenever we'd make a religion check, I'd be like, well, I get a plus zero on that. But I had spent that proficiency point somewhere else. And I was good at um, nature and I was good at survival and I was sort of like a, a fighter hero for a druidic group and um, that led to me being good at things that most druids aren't maybe uh, or many druids aren't but just uh, no longer having that thing that most people count on druids to know right the nature stuff right yeah yeah I, I totally agree that you can kind of take this template or that there's like, I don't know, the template is expanded with 5e, I guess is the best way to put it. You know, um, even as a rogue, like uh, Craig's comment here, you know, you don't, you can totally go in an uh, unusual direction with that. Um, you know, I think there are a few classes where you're fairly bound into something. I mean, I think Paladin is probably one of the more restrictive classes, Warlock by nature of needing that that pact clerics you know, arch as well clerics as well um uh, you know you can't be a cleric and be like well i don't really know anything about my god or i don't really have a relationship with them. actually like, you can uh, <laughs> uh, so a cleric is just a caster who derives their who de- derives their power from a truly divine source so even just a not particularly devout person that a god goes you're a cleric now i think they're a cleric whether they even know about their own religion or not and All I, right. I, I probably wouldn't even <laughs> try that concept as a character. I, that's actually, Stephen, that's the character I'm playing right now in my uh, physical game. Um, he's chaotic good and is the, uh, the, the cleric of a chaotic good god who picked him out of nowhere and kicked him into, you know, start doing chaotic things out in the world for me, uh, but make it good, you know, make it end in people being happy. And so that's what he does and knows very little about what his God is or wants or couldn't tell you a lick of the theology. So, Right. It's, it is absolutely doable. Mm-hmm. You do not have to play, play the proselytizing. That can be an interesting character still, but you do okay. not have to play into the archetype. Right. Well, and there's so many different deities that like it's not necessarily like going to be the perfect map over to some, you know, earth religion either, you know, right. you can, well, you can, you can worship the God of chaos, like, and that is not going to feel like a, a normal deity necessarily. Well, again, D, D&D has, it's got its own cosmology and it's, and it is a, a setting wherein you can actually meet godlike beings face to face. So they, but they're not an omnipotent, say, like a Judeo-Christian God, like we might imagine. They are more finite in their power. Mm-hmm. Um, but anyway, I digress. This isn't going to be a theology lesson. I'm just saying you could be a, 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 a cleric who doesn't really even care about the religion. Now, I, I have a quick question about this, and uh, it's maybe getting slightly off topic, but are there uh, alignment um, rules for worshiping a God and being a cleric of them anymore? Uh, and the reason why I ask that is, you know, I feel like there's absolutely a, a, a expectation in Dungeons and Dragons that if you are the cleric of an evil god, you are out there actively spreading evil. But I think that, you know, when we talked about um, parallels to real world religions, there have been very few examples of, of real world religions being like the god of death is actively evil and trying to kill everyone. Uh, the god of death maybe collects the dead or, you know, is some sort of neutral god. Uh, the god of disease may also be neutral. Um, and I'm wondering if it would be appropriate to play a character who's like the cleric of, um, you know, understanding that there is chaos in the world and that you have to deal with it and the community needs to engage with that chaos. Um, I think, cause I think that would be kind of fun. 
Yeah, I mean, I think I, I don't know if there's finite rules about that because it's just not something that's come up for me as a DM. But I think that mm -hmm. that's probably one of those like make that decision at your table kind of mm -hmm. kind of things. You yeah, know, I don't I, think there is a rule. Yeah, okay. I, I'm kind of like, you know, let's in session zero, like if you're going to make religion a big part of your character, let's talk about it and what that God means to you like, and, and see if it fits. Even sure. down to like the protection from good and evil spell or detect good and evil ability of paladins does not detect alignment. It detects planar or uh, otherworldly origin. Right. It does. The number of times I've mixed that spell up or like thought I was really onto something <laughs> going to cast it and then been like, oh no. Yeah. It'll stop demons and, 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 and celestials and undead and stuff, but it will not, detect another person's alignment, uh, which is actually a change from earlier editions. You know what, though? We've been going for over an hour, and I usually do my mid-roll mm -hmm. after an hour. So let's have a quick mid-roll. Um, come back next week. I believe we are watching, we are talking about season two of Star Wars Rebels, um, which I have thoroughly enjoyed. I've only seen season one so far, but, you know, hey, that's why we're doing it. If you, sometimes I pick stuff to watch for the, sh for the channel, so that I'm motivated to finally get off my butt and watch it. So we'll be we'll be talking about Rebels season two, and then the week after that, I believe it'll be just John Webster and myself where we will be discussing the last four episodes of Star Wars Visions, and then after that, I don't know what we're doing. But like, I've got two weeks of stuff planned out. It's fine. <laughs> um. John, Emily, neither of you are making any content available on the internet right now. John, you used to do a D and D podcast. Yeah, uh, if you're interested, you can still find um, the back episodes of uh, the Playing Rough podcast, uh, which I was the co-host for. We did um, uh, actual play uh, about once every two months or so, and in between, we did reviews of board games and video games. Um, and did deep dives uh, from a, a competitive but cooperative um, point of view. So uh, I usually took the side of the, the casual player, and uh, my co-host took the side of the uh, more competitive. So if you're interested, um, check out the, the back episodes of uh, Playing Rough Podcast. You can get them through any podcast app, uh, and, and they're still out there kicking around. Emily, do you make content? For the internet? I, I do a little bit. Yeah. Um, I am a sometimes co-host of the, the a Song of Ice and Fire podcast called Isle of Faces. Uh, mm -hmm. We are on a short hiatus right now. Um, my my co-host, the main host, uh, it, uh, is taking a little bit of a extended summer break, but we should be back. Um, we there's a lot out there if you like like reread podcasts. Um, he's got chunks for most of uh of A Song of Ice and Fire, um, kind of going along with the uh, history of Westeros' Valar Reredus. Uh, but the what, what I've joined him for is a series on the Winds of Winter. So um, if that's your jam, I know there's some crossover in the chat here. Oh, yeah. Check it out. Otherwise, I just am on Twitter, and I am I joke that I'm becoming, like, kind of a professional uh, live stream guest, uh, that I don't actually do my own content, but I, I you see me pop up here and there. You so. were recently on uh, Radio Westeros. Yeah. Yeah, I was on uh, two streams with Radio Westeros recently um, in part of their Winds of Winter Primer series. So we talked about Victorian Greyjoy, my favorite Dum Dum. Um, I know that Sasuke in the chat is going to have something to say about that, I bet. Uh, and then also uh, about Tyrion as well. So good stuff. Right on, right on. Um, so yeah, f fine folks doing their thing. Um, Got to shout out our patrons. Um, you guys are rock stars. You know how much we love you. Uh, so our Patreon High Council includes Ridiculous Ed Tollett, a.k.a. Sean, the man with the luscious red beard, um, who is just now leaving work to drive home. Drive safe, brother. We love you. Our, he is our alpha patron. Uh, nothing but love for you. We also have Lord John Bronstein, the wise. Six Toe Sounds, a.k.a. JP, the Axe Grinder, and the lovely Lady Leaf Underhill. And our lords, and they are attended by the lords and ladies of the realm, who are Ryan Stavka, the Russian Quartermaster, Reflective Rambling, and 
the wonderful Arch Maester Emma. Arch Maester Emma. There it is. Huh. I talk for a living sometimes. Um, yeah, thank you, patrons. We love you guys. If you want to become a patron, links down in the description. Links to y'all's Twitter is in the description as well. Um, I don't know. You're not a super active Twitterer, John. I see you on there sometimes, but not super active. Uh, Emily, I see more of you. <laughs> but uh, yeah, um, I have officially quit doing my gaming channel for now. It was just getting to be too much. I'm trying to do too many things and something had to give and I gave up live stream gaming. So eh, thanks for those of you that used to join me. Oh, hey, Patrick. Hi. <laughs> and uh yeah so that's at least on hiatus for now um i guess we could turn the conversation back to D. &D. yeah y'all want to talk about making a good session zero yeah yeah Absolutely. um I, I i will admit the first time that i played D, D, we sort of had a session zero and it was purely character creation and um you know, I, I thought that that's what session zero was. And then, you know, it wasn't until I played a bit longer that I kind of started to understand the other things that maybe should be a part of session zero enough that I could like finally run a pretty co cohesive one from the most recent campaign that I've been running for about two years now. Um, uh, you know, where it's not just about building that character. The the most recent one that I ran, we started out by just talking about, you know, what people wanted out of the game and, and high level. Do you like intrigue? Do you like puzzles? Do you like combat? Like, what are you here for? And there wasn't one big unified answer at my table. There was a little bit of everything. Um, I really like intrigue. I really like you know, um, fun plot. I mean, I, I just told you how much I love A Song of Ice and Fire. So, um, you know, I can't help but, but bring a little bit of that kind of thing into my games. Um, but I've, I've, as the DM and wanting everyone at my table to have fun, going to session zero and finding that, you know, most of the people did not care a ton about that and that everyone planned on playing a character with like an intelligence of 11 or lower, uh, it, you know, that that informed my game a little bit and I made some changes and, and um you know, I think I think it's just about at the heart of it, it is finding out kind of what everyone is there for so that when you go to session one and beyond, you can keep that in mind and try to make that the, the heart of your game. Yeah. Um, you know, applying some of those things, um, the I think that the big discussion take will pick up most of the time, most of it, you know, most often. Uh, talking about those big themes. But there are a couple of specific things I think it's important to, to note as well in uh, Session Zero. Um, and one I mentioned earlier is comfort, comfort level with character death. Um, if you are going to be playing a very lethal campaign, uh, another is sort of um, uh, veils and uh, hard stops. Uh, you know, if, if people want to be playing in a game where there is any role playing around sexuality, for example, many people don't like that at all and um, prefer to kind of keep it out of the, the dungeon, I guess. Um, and uh, others um, are, are much more okay with that, but there are, many, uh, there are many motivations for that as well. And so if you're planning on using consent tools in your game, talking about that at your first uh, session zero and recognizing that if you're not using consent tools, that's sort of assumptive consent for anything. And that can be really, um, that can get nasty if not everyone is on the same page. So having a very frank and open campaign uh, discussion about what kind of things might this touch on and what will we be probably avoiding. Uh, mm -hmm. Personally, I veil a lot of the um, uh, darker stuff. You know, we might have torture or something uh, alluded to in the game, but we're probably not going to do a scene where you cut off an orc's toes or something like that. Uh, yeah, I'm not I, interested. Yeah, no. Uh, I also veil most of the sexual things. If people want to have a relationship or even a one night stand at my table, I usually am all right oh. with that. But we're not going to play it out. We're just going to say, all right, you head upstairs. Um, Fade to black. And, yep. Yeah, please do not roll any more acrobatics checks. Stop. Mm -hmm. Just stop. <laughs> we, we did. I. There was a character who made a he was playing a bard and, and he wanted to take this other man to bed. And I'm like, great, you do it. And I forget who it was. It might've been my little brother. He just said, roll performance. 
and it made us all laugh hysterically in the moment. I didn't call for a performance check as a dungeon master. The other player, he was making a, I, I thought it was hilarious in the moment. We all had a good laugh. Um, but no, don't roll for sex, please. Don't do that. Yeah, yep. Yep. Right. I had to shut that down at my table exactly one time. <laughs> Once was enough. Yep. Um, and that's that's something that came up in a session where we like a session zero was purely character creation. We didn't really talk about that kind of thing. Like I said, um, you know, a lot of people who start DMing, you know, they, they might be pretty new to the game, too. Or they might have had a DM who didn't do that. Or they started playing one shots where session zeros aren't necessarily part of it. Um, and, you, you know, I, I think. Um, but it's uh, still the, an important conversation to have. Yeah, yeah. What do uh, you want and what do you absolutely not want? Um, yeah. I was running a pre-made adventure with with people and I didn't read the whole thing first. Um, Leaf was in that game. Leaf has a pretty powerful aversion to arachnids. And this spider is supposed to fall down. And, and so I'm like, well, it's definitely not a spider. It's a cave cricket. And his cave cricket is attacking you, and yeah, it's and, and the funny thing is later in the episode, in the adventure there were actual cave crickets which were completely different. So I'm just like these are cave hoppers, um, and, and it's become almost a meme in the, in in for that group. It was like definitely not a spider, but if somebody has. You know, we're here to have fun. If it's going to limit someone's enjoyment of the game, don't bring it up. Yes. You're right. Uh, we did sort of, I think I think he did roll performance when he said roll performance, and he did roll a 20, which is great. That means he didn't crit my monster later. It was funny. Anyway, definitely not a spider. Uh And but knowing and understanding what your player's limits are is a good tool to have as a DM. And you need to know before you get too far into that. Mm -hmm. Now, um, if you are a player and you are joining a campaign and you're joining it late or you're joining it and the DM doesn't plan to have a session zero, ask. It's okay to ask. And if they're like, what's a session zero? You know, well, show them this amazing video. Um, <laughs> no, there's a lot of information out there on how to run a session zero, what should be included in a session zero. And, and it's okay to ask for it. I mean, I think, um, uh, you know, no one is fully 100% a walking encyclopedia of everything that there is to know about a role-playing game. And so um, if you are hearing about something or want to do something or try something, including a session zero and your table is not planning on doing that, it can be your job to ask for it. I mean, you should feel empowered and safe at your table to ask for things as a player. When I'm when I'm DMing, another thing I like to hear from my players is um, the sort of tone of game that they're hoping to get. Uh, because so everything we're going to have to deal with, every table will have to deal with the, um, the simple fact that sometimes a, a player tries to do something heroic and rolls a one on it, right? And the, the way that you describe that as a DM goes a huge way toward setting the tone. Um, there are lots of people who play that as your, your clumsy oaf of a fighter drops his halberd you know, between his legs, trips over it, and falls down. And that's funny, and it's fun, and can work sometimes. If you're going for a fun table, if you're, you know, plan on doing more comedic or pathetic stuff, but if you're going for a darker tone, if you're going for a more heroic tone, if you're going for really any other tone than sort of goofy friends uh, at, at the table together, um, you can also describe that as, you know, you jam your halberd into the dragon's mouth, but he just, his uh, scales are too strong. Um, you're a skilled fighter who was bested by the situation that they were uh, against. Mm -hmm. um, there are lots of ways to set a tone around um, the expectation. And so... Uh, knowing early on what people are looking for, if they're looking for a, a, an old school dungeon delve, if they're looking for a high fantasy kick in the door uh, and then everybody wins kind of thing, um, or if they're looking for lots of other uh, kinds of tones, that, that's an important session zero discussion as well. Yeah. Tone is a, is a huge thing, like understanding what the DM is presenting to the players and then having the players go, Okay, in that context, 
this is the type of character I would like to play. Sometimes, yeah. like, people will will sit down and be like, I'm going to make a, a wizard, or I'm going to make a, I'm going to make this ranger. And no matter what game comes, I'm going to play this ranger. And the ranger doesn't fit with the rest of the party. Like, the, it's important to use Session Zero to collaboratively, because your character should be informed by the characters around them as well. Yeah, and also, if you're at Session Zero and everyone is kind of vibing with one type of game and it sounds awful to you, like, part of Session being there is that, Session Zero being there is, like, it's a great time to walk away if you if it's not the game that you want and i and i you know i think we all hope maybe would agree that that bad D D is is way worse than no D um and that with the internet out there there's really more than enough ways to find another game if it's not your game so if if everyone wants to do a, a funny campaign and they just want to be goofy and silly and it's going to be uh you know monty python and the holy grail instead of you know uh the witcher which is <laughs> then um and that's what you want you know it's okay you can't you, it's better to do that than join the game anyway not have fun try to drag the table in your direction um you know, I think knowing knowing what you can compromise on and what is just not going to be worth your time or not fun to you is better than trying to make it work. And then, oh, I'm going to bail every other week because I don't really care. Or I'm going to be on my phone the whole time because I, I, you know, I, I'm sick of hearing fart jokes. Like, uh, you know, just just leave. <laughs> right. You not know? every table is the same. Mm -hmm. Every yeah. table is valid, but not every table is for you. Mm hmm. Um, because again, if you're having fun, you're doing it right, but people want different things, so they're going to find fun in different iterations of the game. You can have the fart and fall down game, you know, the beer and pretzels game where it's just a bunch of silly fun. And and you know what, if that's what you enjoy, you're doing it right. Um, that is not the type of game I want to run or play in most of the time. Yeah. Um, I played a one-shot character called Thud No Neck, who is basically a himbo uh, and and I had a blast, but I but I had a blast because I knew it was a one shot. It was a horror themed, you know, slasher, 1980s slasher film. It was the clear uh, Camp Clearwater Massacre? Jolie was our DM, and I played a silly character, but that I I enjoyed my time with him, and I really had fun playing the character for three or four sessions. And then it was done. And it's fine. But in this other game I'm playing, where I probably will go long term, I'm playing a much more serious character. Um, and which is what I tend to prefer. Yeah, I think, uh, Stephen, you made a, a comment about this early on in the stream. Um, one of the worst feelings is really realizing that the kind of fun you were having is causing harm to the fun other people at the table are having. Um, you know, they're, they're, like you said, it's all valid, um, but you need to be careful that what is making you have a good time doesn't hurt the enjoyment of other people. Exactly. Uh, which is what, you know, I actually have that conversation before session zero even happens. This is a game meant to be played by heroes in a high fantasy setting. Great. Go ahead. Um, I had a group say, we want to kind of try, try to play bad guys. Okay, great. I will make something acceptable for murder hobos because that's what you want to play. Great. Right. I knew. The, so, and then when, when somebody else, somebody had to leave. And so we had somebody else join and they had to make a character. And I'm like, look, these are not good people you're coming to, to play with. I mean, the players are wonderful people, but the characters, not good people. You need to make a character that jives with that. And she made a necromancer and great. <laughs> you get it. Don't yeah, bring so a necromancer to the paladin game. And and sometimes it's really subtle. Um, one game I played a long time ago, we had a, a generally good sort of chaotic leaning party that liked to do like grifts and schemes and kind of like work our way through social situations. And we had one player who had started out as a lawful good cleric. And uh, midway through one of the sessions, they were like, my character would feel very uncomfortable doing this and would probably say something, you know, that that outs everyone. And we were like, is this character really a good fit with this 
schemy kind of good guys but grubby party and ultimately they ended up taking on a different character because um you know maybe at the session zero they would have revised that to a neutral good or even a chaotic good um cleric or, or something like that but um just the character they built who was a little bit of a firebrand uh go spread the faith kind of character didn't fit even though they had seemed at first blush like they would have it just sort of evolved over the course of the campaign that the character no longer really made sense in the group mm -hmm. And part of being a good player and part of being a good dungeon master both can be identifying that and having a conversation, this character is not working in this party. Should I retire them and play someone else? Because mm -hmm. I'm still one to play D&D &D with my friends. You know, if you're not feeling your character, change. It's not like... It's not like in a real TV show where if you don't want to play the part anymore, they're going to draw, they're going to bring you back to play another part. That's not how that works. They're going to hire a different actor for that. But here in D&D, we're not limited by our appearance or ethnicity or gender identity or any of that. That's just the character we, we want to play. Um, yeah, and yeah, and if you're like, oh, but is it is it weird? Is it taboo to change characters? Is it weird to maybe have my character step out for I mean like a, a famous critical role Sam Regal does, does that like every campaign it's okay um I, I know uh, I was in a situation where the character that I built I wrote on their sheet chaotic chaotic neutral mm -hmm. I was very incapable of actually playing this character chaotic it was my first game I didn't I'm a pretty lawful person I really struggled and um, for a long time, you know, I, I was also a highly intelligent rogue who then multi-classed into wizard. And I was playing with a bunch That's of absolute chaos. Right. That's, That's the character I'm playing right now. So Such I'm playing one build. character with you in our game. I'm playing a monk. My other character that I'm playing for Jolie's ongoing campaign is a, is a rogue wizard. Yeah, so my rogue wizard, she, you know, uh, she ended up kind of being like the group mom and the group tactician because she was basically wrangling a group of four Leroy Jenkinses is the only one with like one operating brain cell in the party. And I I got frustrated a couple of times. And I sat down with my DM and I'm like, I don't know why Veer is here. I don't know why she wouldn't just say, screw this. Like, let them because ruin it she all. Loves and cares about them. Oh, no, that was not <laughs> the oh, okay. reason. Um, no, but, uh, you know, and he worked with me and, 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 you know, I think going back, I probably would have probably just made a new character but uh we were at a critical point in the story it had been a long time so he wrote an art for my character that got her kidnapped and the party came and saved her and it it forged a bond that made playing with them a lot more fun for me like, later you, you know so i think there's the a lot of ways to resolve it you know and that's good that's being a good player and not just for you but for the other players at the table Mm -hmm. recognizing we need to engage with this other part of our party, even though she's different or whatever, doesn't always see things the way we do. Like it created that bond between the characters themselves. Well, and they, yeah, they, the party right. was forced to do a stealth plan to save her. And they were like, wow, like we, we value her a lot more now. And, you know, maybe when she's planning for us, we shouldn't just, light the plan on fire halfway through and go run into chaos you know right. and it it brought the whole group closer together in a way that allowed me to still play a character i really liked but also have it not feel like i was betraying that character by staying around you know right um dan's got a really good question he's asking about can't this type of conflict in a party sometimes be a good thing and i think it absolutely can it's just down to to how it's handled yeah no. I, please good just realizing that nobody it's not a game you're trying to win nobody should be preconceived to come out on top like it needs to be fair and balanced and the players need to not get upset about it yeah i i've played both in a campaign where um the player con the the character conflicts turned into a group of uh fire forged friends uh you know every the the sort of uh steel sharpens flint kind of situation where everybody's very different but they they made each other better but that was a lot of fun and it was fun playing that arc i also played uh or actually i dm'd for um a very risky campaign i don't suggest this for new dms where ultimately half the party turned on the other in a bloodbath 
uh, which we had to set up uh, out of character weeks ahead of time and make sure everyone was cool with and realized that like player death was a possibility. Um, and that one um, was a lot of fun as well and led to some great stories, but could have gone differently. And I'm glad that it went the way it did. So, um, you know, thinking about it and really scaffolding it well and preparing for um, where where this arc is going to end up, I think is kind of important. Um, it, it can certainly be organic, um, but you don't want it to organically end in a bloodbath. That will just leave, I think, hurt feelings. Unless you've, unless that's the game you're running. Right, yes. Unless that was set up, you know, as part of the right. expectations, for sure. Um, Patrick is correct here. My, an enemy spy, he plays with us on Gold Team. I did, in fact, buy poison to kill his character with or at least to possibly kill his character with. My character did. It was fun. And, and um, that character be... in particular, like we ended that campaign with everybody being enemies. I don't think any of us were friends at the end of that no, campaign. No, I don't think so. Uh, but it was still really fun and, and very complex. So, um, uh, I, thought, I thought Sasa K asked a really great question in the chat. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, this one right here on screen. Perfect. Yeah. Um, so yeah, how do we, how do we as DMs deal with a player who might be falling out of love with their character in a long campaign? I mean, I think hopefully they, they talk to us about it, but I think, you know, there are certainly signs, you know, I, I think that's why I offer about every six months to a year when I run a long campaign, like, let's check in. Is everyone liking things? Do you want to hang out and meet, you know, um, I, I have five people in my campaign. One of them is my husband. We talk about D, D all the time at home so he didn't need to meet with me about it three of them said no one of them said yes and and um she said to me in that session you know i i don't know that i would have built a cleric if i had known how complicated it was and i i said do you what do you want to do about it do you do you want to play something different now do you um, you know, we can retire this character, we can change some things, we can sit down and walk through everything to make sure that you understand it all. Um, and I let that choice be hers. It's not going to break my game. You know, I, I don't have people so tied up into how I want my story to be as a DM that I can't lose a character if they die or if they just don't want to play anymore. Um, and in my situation, you know, just offering her those choices, she didn't know the answer right away. So we had a nice long conversation about it. And um, I was able to kind of ask, ask some probing questions, clarify some things about the character for her. And she ultimately decided, I like the personality of this character a lot. I, um, I'm not a natural role player and it took a long time for me to develop relationships in the party. So even though I don't full, you know, I think spellcasters are kind of hard, I'm going to stick with it because I think learning a new thing and having to reforge those relationships would be too hard for me. But I, I know other people have decided the exact opposite and have switched characters. And I mm -hmm. think all it comes down to as a DM is, is my advice to DMs is to offer your player that choice and to be able to be flexible because ultimately, if you're not, they might not have fun at your table, and that would be pretty sad. Yeah, we uh, we actually had a surprise um, to the players uh, it, retirement in the campaign that I play as a player in last night. Uh, so this is timely timely news here for the stream. Um, the uh, one of the other players made the determination that his storied barbarian character needed to um, retire because he no longer felt. Like he was doing his best role playing, playing as this character. And um, so he contacted the DM a, a week ahead of time and said, I, I'm ready to roll up a new character. Let's give um, my my long running character a, a little bit of a an out where they have an opportunity to come back later if that's something I want or we want or, or whatever. Uh, and so ended up hopping a ride with an inter uh, interplanar shopkeep, um, just hopped right in the, the store and disappeared off to another plane. And their new character showed up down the road, you know, a few minutes later. Um, and uh, it was almost seamless. We had a, a really good session last night. Um, and, and this person got a chance to play something that they really want to play. So uh, I'm, I'm really excited for where this brings them. But I'm going to answer Sasuke's actual question, though. I do not wait to, for them to say something. At the first indication that I think somebody might not be enjoying themselves whether i'm a player or the dungeon master in the game or if it's me uh, if i notice somebody else i will say something to them are you having fun with that character are you having a good time because if you're not you should be playing something else mm -hmm. 
I feel like you could summarize almost everything we've been talking about for an hour and a half with just communication is important. It's the whole game is played by talking to each other. But um, I think some people get the idea in their head that they can't say certain things or that's not the moment to say or, certain or, things. Or, or that the engagement is between the player and the dungeon master exclusively. And it yeah. is not. The, yeah. majority of the engagement actually should be between the players. Mm hmm. Yeah, and that can and and I think people think if the game's not happening, if you're not at the session, like oh, we got to save everything for the session. Then you got other players who get into the session. Well, I don't want to interrupt the session, and a lot of it doesn't get resolved. And I think, uh, I don't know, um, yeah, just talk to each other and and don't feel like you can't ask. You know, if and, and if you ask and someone reacts poorly, that's not a reflection on you. That's that's you know, them uh, very much misunderstanding the most critical element of the game, which is talk to each other, work it out. You know, and, and as far as like in-game time goes, one of the things we talked about really early on was don't hog the spotlight, uh, you know, share it around. Um, I think that the sense of how long to keep the spotlight is something that comes with time. And it's something that um, you, you develop a sense of that, especially with a group of people. Uh, you know, if you should have a session, you know, that is five minutes long, or if really you should only take the spotlight for 30 seconds, um, you know, and because those feel like very different amounts of time, depending on how much fun you're having and how invested everyone is. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I know that we've had some really great uh, set scenes of a couple of characters talking about things that interest their characters, but maybe not other characters at the uh, at the table. And so knowing how long to keep a scene like that going and then when to, to sort of fade to black and move on to the next thing, it's not something you can easily teach because it depends group to group and um, you kind of get a and situation to situation and right. like, yeah, yeah, it, there is no five minutes and 14 seconds. When in doubt, I think the best way when you're just trying to develop this skill, because it is a skill that takes time to develop, just... I try to think to myself, you know, if I was sitting there listening to someone be me right now, would I be like, wrap it up? You know, because <laughs> I I think we've all been there at the table where, you know, you're like, oh, my God, like on my turn, all I did was run 60 feet. Like uh, what? Like, how long am I going to have to sit here now? Or yeah, if you're not stop trying, stop trying to win and mm -hmm. and do something. Oh, yep. OK, so we got maybe a little over 20 minutes left. Um, we can continue down this road of conversation, but I also wanted to make sure if we've got something you want, make sure you want to say, let's make sure we get it out there because we've got a little over 20 minutes left right now. Um, and yeah, and mom says, like in real life, communication is key to good relationships. Indeed. Mm -hmm. And and that's between the player and the DM and the players and other players. Um, it's it's so much more interesting to be part of a crew. Like in the game where John and I are playing together right now, uh, he is playing a cleric of a very specific, well-defined uh, religion in that game world. I am a I'm playing a warlock of a different sort of power. Yes. And one of my favorite things that we do is argue about theology. Right. Uh, we, we do things like uh, that slightly needle each other, but are also helpful, like blessing one another. Mm -hmm. That's uh, a lot of fun um, just to kind of uh, play out that, that dynamic. And it's, it's great. But I still think my favorite thing is when we is, is our comparative religion talks where we, yeah. you know, it's, it's a lot of fun, but that's like one character to another character. And maybe, Maybe the conversation lasts three minutes mm -hmm. between the two of us, but that's the length of a good scene of television as well. Right. Which is part of the reason that I always try to relate it back to TV on some level. Mm -hmm. It's a scene. Let the scene play out. And then like, yeah, you don't have to like beat the conversation to death. We can assume your character continues talking about more mundane things. Like, you know, when, when the action of the scene is over, move on, you know? Yeah, there's yeah. a few other little considerations too. Like the the campaign itself is built um, currently around some big set piece combats. So when these little um, you know more quiet asides take place, where we talk among our characters between these major combats, uh, it, it provides a nice tone break. Whereas if this was a much more um, uh, I guess like role play heavy or even like intrigue heavy campaign. We might want to limit the length of those sessions or something. Uh, as it stands, they work great, uh, I think. Um, 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. And it's been a lot of fun. Um, I was going to make a point about something. This <laughs> is not a game that you win. You do not win Dungeons & Dragons. You cannot win Dungeons & Dragons. If you think you are, you're about to lose it. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh, this is hilarious. Well, role play is like hugging. We all know when it lasts just a little bit too long. You are not wrong. But if, but like you should, when, when, when the spotlight falls on you, do your thing, but get out of the spotlight as quickly as you can. That's the answer. How long should it last? As short as possible to, to get the, well, there's, I'm going to date myself. There's an old saying that a skirt or what was it? Uh, when a speech should like, should be like a skirt long enough to cover the subject, but short enough to remain interesting. Um, and, and the same goes for a scene in your D and D game, get to, get to the heart of what's happening there and then get out of the way for the next thing to happen. Mm -hmm. Pacing, pacing. We haven't said it this entire conversation, but that is a huge thing. If you can do whatever it is you're trying to do in half the time, you're going to get through twice as much of the story at a time. And it's going to feel bigger and more epic because of it, because more stuff is happening. And, yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I've had games where, you know, we play for three hours and characters spend three hours shopping for stuff. Uh, it'd be like that sometimes. But, uh, but if you can do it as quickly as possible and get onto the next thing, it feels like more is happening in the game. Yeah, and I think you should you should help your DM out there too. And and uh, you know, I think sometimes uh, we don't know what your expectations are. It seems like someone's really latching on to role play, so we kind of allow that when uh, mm -hmm. you know four other people are zoning out and like, dear God, make it end. And I think um, that's something that you know that'd be good meta feedback for your DM outside of the session of uh, of that you know and I don't know about you guys since we since we're talking about how to you know be a good player to bring your a game but like DMs want feedback like don't end the session and be like thanks it was good and then not talk to them until the next session like please like I I spend a ton of hours writing and working on things when I'm not there like I would love to to that, have that not happen in an echo chamber. I would love to hear what you think and what worked and what didn't work. I want to get better. Uh, I want to know what you think. M maybe you noticed another player struggling and I had a thousand tabs of monster stats open and didn't notice it like you did. You know, I, I think um, please talk to us and then DMs, please ask your players for feedback and don't be that DM that's I'm infallible and I don't actually care what they think because I'm running my game. Like, you know. Yeah. And you can formalize that or you can make it informal. I know at one table that I'm a player at, um, there's a formal session at the very end of the, the night before you leave, you tell your favorite part of the evening and you tell something you either wish had happened or something you hope will happen soon. That can either be story or it can be meta. It can be, you know, I really wish we had spent more time uh, preparing before we, we fought, you know, or, or whatever. Uh, so, so that's pretty, pretty nice. I think if you don't like the formal setup, you can always just informally talk. Right. I mean, like, so without getting too much into meta discussion about rules and the way I run my game in particular, I, I use milestone leveling for Dungeons and Dragons fifth edition. There are other games where you pretty much absolutely have to use experience points. One of those games is a game I've played a great deal of. It's called Vampire the Masquerade. Um, in that game, you, you do not level up. You earn experience points, and then you spend those points to improve your a specific skill or other ability. You don't level up, and everything gets a little bit better. You just you spend your XP to level up what you want to increase the abilities you want to increase. Um, but one of the ways I liked to keep everybody engaged, and this was a great... A uh, trick that you can use some way. There are ways to integrate it into D&D if you want. But at the end of the session, be like, so I give out maybe two to three experience points to every player based on different criteria. Did you show up? Did you oral play your character? Did you have your oh my God moment? You know, blah, blah, blah. But at the end, there's always, I have the whole table vote. Well, who gets the bonus point for being, who gets the bonus point for this this adventure 
vote for whoever you want except yourself but you know you want that extra experience point which is going to get you to the next ability a little bit faster well guess what you have to play well enough that everybody else at the table thinks you deserve it and that's a way to keep people engaged and it all it's a it's a re, very real reward to get 33 percent more experience points than everybody else so, it's, also low, it's also low stakes enough that if you don't win a couple sessions in a row you don't get like envious of the other players um you know there's there's one um session there's one system that i'm thinking of that specifically asks like did you risk something over the course of this session and so it drives people to gain experience by risking more things which i thought was was kind of fun mm -hmm. yeah yeah one one of the uh one of the experience points i give out is that uh that epic hero moment type thing and for D and I, I mean, I do it similarly, um, but you level up from doing something awesome, not because I'm just like I'm ready to run the next level, the next higher CR monsters at you. No, I I want you to have done something awesome and feel like the level up is a reward for killing that dragon, for solving that mystery, for overcoming that puzzle, whatever. Mm -hmm. Um. But it's harder. Anyway, it's not harder. Engaging characters, there's a lot of different ways to do it. And a lot of times, I think it does boil down to what what do they want out of the game? And how is the best way I can give it to them? And like there is value to be had being a player that knows what the other players want out of the game. Because those are my friends. I understand what my friends' hopes and dreams are and what it is that they want out of life. Presumably, at least my close friends, I do. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. w uh, my character should actively seek to, when it's when it's John's turn to be in the spotlight, my character should be there, rooting him on. Not mm -hmm. standing, leaning up against the wall with my arms folded, waiting for my turn in the spotlight. Mm -hmm. You know, this discussion actually reminds me of one more thing that I think everyone should cover in session zero, and it's one that might come out of left field for a lot of people. And that is, um, if you are okay as a player with having your sense of power progression interrupted, by which I mean, are you comfortable with negative levels? Are you comfortable with people taking away your magic items? There are some tables that that is the only hot button issue that will make them upset at you is removing um, their artifacts or their magic items um or or even you know having a, a white attack you and uh suck away some of your max hit points that's or, why they don't do that anymore yeah well right exactly and and it's mostly gone uh that is true um but uh you know i think that there were a lot of people who ran um encounters they expected to be fun that turned out not to be fun because they didn't realize that their party would hate that one thing losing what they had worked for so far mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, I've got a team, they're level eight. They they have a staff of the Magi in their party's possession. Um, that's a magic item far too powerful for level eight characters. And the thing is, they're terrified to use it because they don't want anyone to know that they have it. So they have this ultra powerful magic item. And it's not that they've never used it, but they're extremely careful. They don't just run around blasting off fireballs through their uh staff of the magi because they know somebody way more powerful than them is going to see that and be like that's mine now so like and i, I do make it clear when i run my games uh there is a chance you can die i'm not trying to kill anybody but any of you can die um john you weren't playing in gold team yet but i killed one of kurt's characters um in Ruby team, that's like my brother and Jess and Jolie are in that team. I killed my little brother's character. Uh, I didn't set out to kill him, but when a T-Rex crits you and you're already at like three hit points, it's it's bad for you, you know? And he was the cleric, so nobody had Revivify or whatever it is, and that was the end of that character. And my brother, who was a good player, to his credit, just said, it'd be like that sometimes rolled up a new character and was playing a, a rune knight fighter in the next session. 
Yeah, and I think if you're if you are a player and you become so attached to your character that you don't want them to die, I think that's a good time to question in character if maybe they would retire if they, you know, value their life more than whatever else is going on. I mean, um, I know like I play one character who is super precious to me, and so I don't bring her into all these one shots that she might die in. You know, I, I'm saving her for, uh, you know, the main story I have planned with my dm and and uh you know figure that stuff out too like it's a, it's okay to uh say oh yeah i'm fine with character death and then change your mind later uh just you have to tell someone that you've changed your mind or your dm might kill them <laughs> uh you are correct potter what this which is why john brought up whites specifically because they used to suck levels away and it is the worst feeling you can have as a player like, yeah, I don't think I, as a dungeon master, have ever done that to a player, ever taken levels away. Now, I've taken away magic items, and I've taken away things that characters have worked for and built, not in a malicious way, but, like, sometimes to drive a story, you've got to, you've got to hit them where it hurts. Yeah, same, Stephen. I was going to just say, I um, one of the things I like to do is give my characters morality pets uh you know a town that they protect um a castle that they really love uh an npc who's goofy and funny and they love you know that sort of thing um and then put them in danger <laughs> um and sometimes right. they get taken away and sometimes they don't and um it, you know another nice thing about that is giving them a village that they love allows them to retire uh in a way that's not like i don't know i i guess i quit adventuring and disappear no they they go and they settle down in that village that you love and and they sit around there and they tell old stories about the time that they, you know, stole the witch's hand or something. So, well, or presumably you get high enough level, you have characters who can teleport and then yeah. being at home is <laughs> a lot easier all of a sudden. Sure. Um, I remember <laughs> on a loot table, like someone, I, I decided I was going to just let people roll on the loot table for one session. And of course my level eight at the time party gets the helm of teleportation. And all of a sudden, the second half of that session was them using all three charges of it to go all over the continent to places that I was not prepared for. Um, my, my, I have a helm of, helm of teleportation that we got when, when I was third level. Yes. That's <laughs> ridiculous. It is ridiculous, <laughs> but like, and it very nearly broke. I almost pissed off the whole party by stealing it and running away. But I'm like, you know what? I can't... I, it might be what the character would do, but like, th that's the last thing I want to make sure that I get in. Yeah. That's what my character would do is the worst excuse you can give me as a, as a player. I'm, I mean, it's got some value and some weight when you are deciding what you want to do. That is one of the things you can should consider, but you need to consider everything else we've talked about up to this point about having consideration for the dungeon master's plan for the other player's enjoyment of the game. If your player would be just an absolute bag of dicks to everyone around him, then you're playing the wrong character. Mm -hmm. If that's yeah. what my character would do is, is something that I think weak people use to justify being bad players. It's like, hold on, hold on. Didn't you build this character though? Like you understand it's not a real person making these choices. It's you in the driver's seat. So why, right. why is this what your character would do is kind of my, my, my <laughs> question back to that. Yeah. There are um, several things they might be saying to you when they say those words mm -hmm. uh, and figuring out which of those meanings they're really hanging on is extremely important. Yeah. You know, and I think, I think it's okay occasionally, you know, to do something that is like, Here's a great what my character would do moment. My uh, my character or a character in one of my games uh, again had a item very powerful for their level. They had a, a wand of wish with one charge left, and um, they had just saved some people from a group of Yanti and several of them were actually like transformed into Yanti minions and the fighter very lawful good was like, I'm going to use my wand. This is my item and use the final charge of wish to save these complete randos. And the party was pretty upset. What if we die later because you use this now? Um, but he's like, it's my, item. I want to do what I want to do. And, uh, you know, I think those moments 
can be okay. But if you find sure. yourself saying that multiple times every session, then if you're you, using you know, it to justify like behaving in ways that are detrimental to the paladin using the wand of wish to help somebody else is very in character. And I think as a dungeon master, it would be like, makes perfect sense to me. Mm -hmm. But just, but using the, that's what my character would do to justify, to justify random chaotic, because it's never said by anyone more than the person playing the, the chaotic neutral character either. Yeah. I, I think if you can't explain necessarily your, um, character's actual thought process in a way that makes sense to everyone at the table, then that's a very bad excuse. So for example, Emily, your, yours there, that's what heroism means to that character, right? And, and to be a hero means to put ourselves in danger in order to save these people we don't know, um, and future danger, hypothetical danger, whatever. But if you're that chaotic rogue and that's, that's the, what my character would do, are you really just saying like, that's what I kind of want to do in this moment? Are you saying like, why, why would they do that? You know, is it, um, and why are you playing a character that would do that? Like you said, Steven, um, <laughs> right. <laughs> right now with this group of people. So. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I, I, I agree. Uh, so final thoughts, any, anything you want to make sure you get said, Emily or John? I think, you know, if, if you're talking about how you want to bring your A game, like, uh, you know, aside from everything we've already said here, the number one thing is, is you know, ask your DM what that means. Or if you are the DM or, or even if you're not, ask the table what that means. Uh, it doesn't have to be confined to session zero, it, you know, especially if you're playing. I'm playing in a campaign that's go, been going for almost two years and it'll probably go two years more because we we play slow. Everyone's married with kids and, and it takes a while. But um you know, those things evolve over time. What I wanted in 2019 is not what I want in 2021. And I feel the same for my players. So I think, you know, just keep that conversation open, respectful, and, you know, you really can't go too wrong. Yeah, we, we've raised a lot of advice, I think, here. And maybe trying to keep it all in our heads at the same time might be a, a bit of a fool's errand. Um, I think that if you go in with the right intentions and you, you are cheering on the rest of your party and you're cheering on your DM, you're going to make a good player. If you're cheering on all your players, you're going to make a, a pretty decent DM. Don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Um, mm -hmm. I think you're absolutely right that bad D&D &D can certainly be worse in a lot of ways than no D&D, &D, but good D&D &D is great and great D&D &D is even better. So, yeah. um, you know, it, it's it's all a, a progression toward that greatness. You don't need it to be perfect the first time. Do your and best to grow into it. And when you achieve that greatness, it's still not going to be perfect every time you do it. Like, yeah. again, don't don't let perfect be the enemy of, of good enough or even excellent, you know. Um, there's, we're not professionals. Nobody getting paid to do this. So, like, if you if you get a ruling wrong, if you're not always ready in the moment, exactly like, you know, knowing exactly where you want to move and exactly what's going, like, it, it'd be like that sometimes, and that's okay. Um, getting beating yourself up over not being as prepared as you want to be is also not helpful. So, just uh, allow yourself to still be human. But yeah, if you do your homework so that you know how your character works mechanically, how they think and feel about things and you you go to the table and and try to fulfill that personality in engaging with the other people who are doing the same thing you're, you're right there and dms facilitate that by giving by, by leaning into things that the characters care about mm -hmm. yeah absolutely uh, potter go enjoy your game i know you've got one that's starting right now <laughs> the cla classic D and D, old school, like be not even first edition advanced Dungeons and Dragons, like old school red box D and D. This is this is where like break a leg, uh, kill a character is like real good advice because yeah, don't name your character till third level. Yeah. Don't get too attached. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, so have fun, my man. Um, but yeah, it's. It's seven o'clock my time, eight o'clock over there on the East Coast where you guys are at. <laughs> um, I, I, we've had a lot of really great things to say. We've had a lot of really great people in the chat contributing their questions and thoughts. Um, 
thanks everyone who is here live. Uh, you really made this a, a great experience. Emily, John, what can I say? Like, we just need to have a podcast where we talk about D&D stuff. Because <laughs> I, I like that we, we have different experiences for sure, but mm -hmm. we've all kind of arrived at the same spot where we know what we want out of the game. We know what makes it good. I think we all want more or less the same thing out of the game. We, it's a good crew, man. I can see mm -hmm. the four pieces of a new party right here. Um, <laughs> yeah, who wants to DM for us? We all need a break. <laughs> yeah, because we're all so frequently the dungeon master. Um, but yeah, it, this was a great time, y'all. Uh, I love D and D. Um, I love talking about it. So Emily, John, both of you, thank you so much. Thank for you for joining me for this. Thank uh, you. Come back next week. We'll be talking about uh, season two of Star Wars Rebels, an animated show which I have enjoyed a great deal. All right. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I've got D and D tomorrow night. And I believe on Saturday I'm playing with Emily and John. I don't know when we're playing next, but it ain't that far off. Yeah, come around again soon. Yep. So yeah, and and anyone who's in the chat right now, um, you know. You know where to find me. John's on Twitter. Emily's on Twitter. Their stuff is down there in the description. Their links to their Twitter is down there in the description. I'll answer questions anytime. If you want one of their takes, they'll answer questions as well. Absolutely. I'm sure. I don't want to like put you on the hook or anything, but Emily, I know what you do already. Like you are a forever DM in another sort of community the same way I am. Uh, but yeah. Twitter's there for a reason. Hit me on Twitter if you got a question. And I mm -hmm. bet they would feel the same way. Absolutely. <laughs> um, and if you are not a player and you want to play, there is a place for you. Uh, maybe not necessarily in my game, but ask me and I'll point you in the right direction because it's not, it's not hard to find a game of D&D &D these days. It's actually not. My, my problem is is like finding a day when the match is for everyone, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, and it'd be like that sometimes, too. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I guess that's the end. I always struggle at the end of these things. <laughs> like, I just start rambling and don't know when to wrap it up, which means that it's time to wrap it up. So thanks, friends. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. Uh, friends you. in the chat, um, we love you guys. We'll see you in the next one. And until then, you know what it is. Peace and be excellent to each other.